And this is the argument that's sketched out in the textbook, and the one that I'll go through quickly to show you the geometrical argument. So this one, once you know to make it, this is actually easy, because we are making a bunch of approximations for this one particular line of argument. So I want to use what's already on, in the drawing here, this point here. That point on the screen is not at the same distance from the two slits. You can see that in the sketch itself, right? OK, then the question is, all right, how much is the difference in that path length? And um, if you want to do exact geometry, it'll get complicated. So this is the picture I want you to imagine. Let me um, erase some of the stuff I drew, because they are in the way. Um, so this is what I want you to consider. So uh, I'm going to imagine drawing an isosceles triangle. So um, like something like this. These two have the same length. Good. Then what I can say is that this distance is the path length difference. This is my delta x. Good. Now, now this is the approximation I'm going to make. Uh, this is lower division class. We only do, this is what's called the far field approximation. So uh, in case you ever take the upper division version of this, this is called the far field approximation. And the approximation we are making is that this distance to the screen, L, is much greater than some reference length scale. What other lengths do you see? Um, in this diagram that I have not yet, uh, I kind of labeled implicitly. D, right? The distance between the uh, slit. Let me label it explicitly. So this is the only other distance scale you have. So when the distance to the screen is much larger than this distance, that's uh, when we use the, something called the far field approximation in upper division. Um, it's the only situation we consider, so you don't have to worry about the name. So under this approximation, this is what I can say. Can I say that whatever this angle is, it's going to be very small? Right? Then what I also can say is that whatever these two angles are, they're going to be approximately 90 degrees. So I can say approximately this triangle here is a right triangle that makes the rest of my algebra so much easier. Okay? Uh, let me point out a couple other simplifications that come out of this approximation. Um, so for example, uh, I can draw three different angles. I can draw angle theta one here. This is you know, horizontal, and this is at how much angle above this is. And I can draw angle theta two. And I can draw a third angle. Let's say, you know, I don't like having these two different angles. So I'm going to instead choose to measure the angle, your angular position of the screen from the center between the slit. Right? So I can do that. I can have this line here that I'm going to measure the angle of. Call this, I don't know, theta average. Yeah? Under this far field approximation, how do these three different angles simplify? Yeah, they are one and the same. So um, in the, um, I mean, and that makes intuitive sense, right? If the slits are not very far compared to the whole distance, then when you actually try to measure them, they will end up being the same. So I'm going to just stick to using this. I'm going to stick to only using theta average, and I'll just call that theta. And when you look at this figure, you can kind of see how you would measure and express this theta too. You can express this theta as, um, so um, one way to write this would be, well, I see this right triangle here. I have the distance. I have the height, or it's y position I'm considering. So I could say that this theta is the arc tangent of y over l, or something like that. You've done enough trigonometry to know that. Um, um, but now that I've defined the theta, how you would get it from some surrounding information, let me label the theta somewhere proper. Uh, I will label it here, because it's going to make my life a little bit easy. Yeah? 
once I, so I have a motivation for labeling the theta. So I identified this right triangle as helping me figure out some detail of this interference phenomena. So I want to know some of the angles of this right triangle. Right? Uh, with the theta defined this way, I can label the theta here just as easily, right? For a screen very far away, these two, even though they don't look like it, these two are actually parallel. So these two angle thetas are the same. And once I have drawn this theta, then this is what I'm claiming. This is also theta. Yeah. So um, all of this ar geometric argument is leading us to give us this expression. This path length difference is equal to, well, I have the hypotenuse, d. I have the opposite angle. So it should be d times the sine theta. And all the other formulas you will see for double slit interference, it comes out of these two things. One, the path length difference for path from the sl in each slit to the particular point on the screen. And how this path length difference relates to phase difference. So we've been talking about phase, but I guess I never made it explicit how you go from, how you go from the path length difference to phase difference. Some of you might have, might guess this intuitively. It's, um, it, I, I don't know, it depends on the person. I don't want to just say it's trivially easy because for some people it won't be. Um, but if you have guessed this, guessed this relationship that I'm going to spell out intuitively, then great. If you haven't, let me spell it out and see if that makes sense. Um, so what I have is I have the difference in the space that it's going to travel. So I start out with the delta x. But I don't really want express expressions of length. I want expressions of phase. So I want to refer it to some point on the cycle. So I don't really want the length. What I want is the length divided by the periodic, uh, periodicity in length. So that would be the physical length divided by wavelength. That sounds okay to everyone? Okay, so this is giving me what fraction of a cycle this delta x is. If this turns out to be a one half, then I have half of a cycle. I, that would be actually the 180 degrees in phase difference. So that would be out of phase if something is uh, different by half a wavelength or half a wavelength plus an integer. In many of the formulas, you won't really want a fraction of a cycle. You want a phase angle. You want the degrees or, I guess, radians. So here what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to take this fraction of a cycle and multiply it with a 2 pi to convert it from cycles to radians. This is the kind of thing that's easy to miss because um, both the cycles and radians, they are fake units. There's no meters and seconds. and <laughs> So you have to keep reminding yourself, this is a fraction of a cycle. Now that I have multiplied it to pi, now that's in radians. <laughs> so this is the phase difference. This is the relationship between phase difference and the path length difference. So in the general language we are going to use, um, this is what we can say. We can say you get constructive interference. Constructive interference. When, um, so I want to express it in terms of the phase difference because that's going to be the common language you use for any interference. I want this phase difference to be I guess zero will work, right? Uh, what other angles will work other than zero? Two pi, four pi. Two pi, integer multiples of two pi, right? So it would be zero plus two pi times n, where in the mathematical language, uh, n is a number, member of, I guess it can be an integer that's, it's been so long. It can be negative actually, right? So, right? Yeah, so G is the set name for integer, right? It's been so long since I've used this language. Okay, good. <laughs> so that's the constructive interference. So I, we don't actually need that zero there. 
Uh, but um, so let me actually uh, rewrite it in a way that's more understandable. So we can say pi, uh, phi is equal to two pi times n, where n can go from zero plus minus one plus minus two plus minus three and so on. In terms of the, some of the vocabulary you will see in the textbook, this is n equals zero will re, for the double slit interference. This, this is the central maximum. That's the brightest spot you will see. And this plus one, plus two, uh, plus minus two, plus minus two, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, these uh, refer to nth order maximum. So you might, uh, your textbook might call this a first order maximum, or first order bright fringe. Uh, the other language you will see is the phrase bright fringe. But when you start counting orders, I want you to remember that it's counting what value of n this is. So that's for constructive interference. Um, I guess the language gets a little bit more careful for destructive interference. Uh, let me write it out first. So for um, destructive interference, so your delta phi should be, what's one value that works? Pi works, right? Um, does minus pi work? Yeah, minus pi works. Now, does two pi work? Yeah, two pi, I mean, two pi is this. Um, doesn't work, minus two pi doesn't work. How about three pi? Works, right? So what it looks like is we want odd, in, odd, uh, odd multiples of pi. So let me write it down this way. Uh, plus minus, um, 2n minus 1 times pi. I'm just being overly careful. I just want a general expression. And I'm going to say the n goes from 1, 2, 3, and so on. That covers all the possibilities that we are discussing. When n is equal to 1, I get 1 pi plus minus pi. When n is equal to 2, I get um, 4 minus 1, so 3 plus minus 3 pi. And um, the reason I'm writing it this way because, is because with this written out, this is what I can say. I can say this refers to the order of, um, I can say this refers to order of dark fringes. So when someone refers to the first order dark fringe or the second order dark fringe, third order, that's, this is what they are referring to. So, um, so once you understand this uh, um, rule, the phase difference uh, plays in interference, and once you understand this uh, geometric consideration in double slit interference, then the rest kind of follows naturally. Oh, let me drive the formula that's in the, your textbook. So you might see this formula in your textbook, um, which you know, some people just memorize, and it's one of those formulas that you don't really have to memorize. So these are the formulas you will see in the textbook. Um, D is equal, to, uh, let's see. It, you would uh, um, see for constructive interference, you would say uh, D sine theta is equal to M lambda, where M goes from, uh, M goes from zero, one, two, and so on. And for destructive interference, you would see d sine theta is equal to uh, m plus one half lambda, or do they use n at this point? Minus one half lambda, where m goes from one to three and so on. Maybe they use n. No, I think n is used for diffraction. So, so you know, you you could uh, look up these formulas in the textbook. Memorize it, not knowing where they came from. What I'm telling you, what I was telling you before, is where these formulas come from. So once you have this condition, then what you can do now is use your knowledge of the relationships. 
between the phase and the path length difference, and the relationship between path length difference and the actual geometrical setup, d and theta. So uh, let me call this two. So using these two simple expressions that you could uh, figure out uh, sitting at your desk on your own, once someone showed you what the right path was, you can go from this intuitive relationship about the phase difference to these formulas in a quick step. Let me just do that now so that you see it. Um, so I guess it's a, just a matter of plugging in it. I have 2 pi n here. Let me plug, wow, this is confusing. That's not x, it's just multiplication. <laughs> um, let me just plug this in for delta phi. So you have uh, 2 pi times delta x over lambda is equal to 2 pi n. The 2 pi's will cancel. Let me not worry about that for now. Let me plug in what delta x is. So you get uh, d sine theta over lambda is equal to n. So you get d sine theta is equal to n times lambda. The exact same thing what you had from the book. And here, um, it would be the exact same thing. Um, you have 2 pi times delta x over lambda is equal to this whole thing. Uh, let me just leave, uh, let me factor out 2. Um, so you have um, n minus 1 half times 2 pi. So 2 pi will cancel again. Let me not worry about that. Uh, plug in what delta x is. So you have d sine theta over lambda is equal to n minus 1 half. Or multiply, a, multiply both sides by lambda, you get d sine theta is equal to n minus 1 half times lambda. Or the exact same formula that's in the textbook. So, um, I mean, you, you know, if, if it's a matter of memorizing formulas from textbook, everyone can do that. Uh, I want you, to, want you to start out with this so that you don't get over fixated on these formulas. Here's what I'll tell you. These formulas, they are derived for a specific situation. They are derived for exactly this. Double slit, in air, um, slit, some slit separation, no other complications. Once you start adding complications, well, one of them uh, that you will see as a challenging problem that I'm going to try to assign as a homework problem is what would happen? So we started, out, we started out with the assumption that these two are in phase originally, right? What would happen if we made them out of phase? What would happen if we place a little glass plate here with, with some index of refraction so that light coming out over here has different phase than this? If all you know is, uh, is this formula, then you are stuck. You have to do everything from scratch. But if you know these steps, then what you can do is you can start by modifying the phase relationship. You can say, all right, there's this phase uh, difference that came from the path length difference, but maybe there's plus additional phase difference that's just added in for a different reason. And you can do the rest of the derivation. And once you cast everything in terms of phase, it's actually pretty simple derivation. So I want you to see that. <laughs>